the very idea of government-funded theater was controversial, but particularly government-funded theater that addressed political issues was controversial. Welcome to Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm Terry Finneman, and I research media coverage of women in politics. And I'm Nick Hershon, and I research the history of New York sports. And I'm Ken Ward, and I research the journalism history of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. And together, we're professional media historians guiding you through our own drafts of history. Transcripts of the show are available online at journalism-history.org slash podcast. This episode is sponsored by Taylor & Francis, the publisher of our academic journal, Journalism History. You're probably familiar with the Broadway show Newsies, which gives audiences a live look from the stage into what the newspaper industry used to be like. But it turns out news and live theater had already merged decades earlier in a forgotten chapter of journalism history. Between 1935 and 1939, the New York Living Newspaper Unit created six living newspaper theater productions that brought news to the stage. The efforts were funded with federal money as part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programs during the Great Depression. The most popular show, One Third of a Nation, ran for 10 months and drew over 200,000 audience members in New York, with additional shows running in other cities around the country. On today's show, we have Jordana Cox of the University of Waterloo to discuss her new book, Staged News. Jordana, welcome to the show. I had no idea, not only that there used to be theater performances about the news many years ago, but also that there currently is an annual living newspaper festival at the Jackalope Theater in Chicago. So how did you find out about this topic? By accident uh, and through a rather winding path, I had loved and participated in theater uh, since I was a child, uh, but in college I had studied political philosophy. So I had become particularly interested at the end of college in the relationship between theater and politics and how theater could be a place for people to think together about political issues. So in my first few years of grad school, I was looking all over the place in theater history for examples. And I started out with Greek tragedy and I looked at the Weimar theater of Bertolt Brecht um, and uh, the Brazilian theater of Augusto Boal. And then at some point, I don't remember exactly when or how I stumbled on a script of a living newspaper. Um, and it was the most popular living newspaper, One Third of a Nation, which was about uh, the housing um, shortage of available housing, um, sanitary housing, affordable housing uh, during the Great Depression. And I was really struck by this moment in the play where a character named the little man jumps out of the audience and gets up onto the stage to ask questions to this booming loudspeaker about why he can't find a decent place to live. And I was so intrigued by this strange and um, interactive way of engaging with news to think about politics that um, I dove into living newspapers from there. You note that both the newspaper and theater industries were struggling during the Depression years, not only with declines in revenue from consumers, but also the increased competition from newsreels, radio, and motion pictures. But how did this idea of turning news into theater productions even come about, and how would journalism and theater even think to partner together? Well, the idea was not exactly a brand new one even though many of the makers of living newspapers would claim that it was. Uh, many theater makers in the U.S., um, particularly involved in the workers' movement in the 20s and 30s, were inspired by agitprop street performances that they had seen or heard about in revolutionary Russia, where living newspapers had began as oral recitations of the news on street corners and workers' halls, uh, particularly for workers who were not literate, who could not actually read the news. Um, living newspapers in revolutionary Russia were popularized by a company called Blue Blouse that eventually 
uh, traveled outside of Russia, including to the uh, Weimar Republic, where they inspired German documentary theater makers like Erwin Piscator um, and, and later uh, Bertolt Brecht. So some uh, American theater makers had already gotten a taste of what this form could offer in Europe um, or through adaptations of this European form. Um, but the distinctive form that living newspapers took during the Great Depression in the, in the U.S. really had to do with two major labor initiatives that came together, came about kind of at the same time. One of them was an employment uh, initiative serving out-of-work theater makers, and the other was uh, the beginnings of a uh, labor union for editorial staff, for reporters um, and editors. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly explain each of those. Um, the Federal Theater Project was an employment initiative that was funded by the federal government's Work Progress Administration, also known as the WPA. Um, the WPA funded all kinds of employment uh, initiatives. Among them were arts initiatives, including the Federal Theater Project, which made uh, cheap theater across the country and at the same time gave jobs to theater makers who were struggling to find them. So the Federal Theater Project had this mandate to put theater makers to work. At the same time, um, editorial staff, reporters and editors who didn't yet have a union were starting to come together uh, and organize themselves um, to fight for uh, better working conditions. Um, there uh, was a mythology, which I think in many ways has stayed with us today, that newspaper reporters, in order to do their jobs well, really had to be left to their own devices and just chase a beat um, no matter what it took to hell with uh, keeping regular hours um, or getting home to the family or, or whatever a nine to five job might offer. Um, editorial staff were starting to question the lack of protections that came with that idea, which circulated uh, in, in popular film and popular media. Uh, David Welke has uh, written about this um, in his uh, wonderful book. Um, so editorial staff were coming together and beginning to form in uh, 1933 what would become the American Newspaper Guild. And um, one of the uh, um, early members of the American Newspaper Guild was a guy named Morris Watson, who um, was fired for his work organizing uh, the American Newspaper Guild, uh, from his job at the time with the Associated Press. So Watson was out of a job and he found himself basically the first person, as far as I can tell, in human history who found a backup <laughs> plan in a theater career um, and found himself working for the Federal Theater Project. And there he would become the um, managing producer of a group of journalists and theater makers who would work together to make original plays about the news um, for the American public. Yeah, so expand on that a little bit and what else journalists were doing. Did journalists just do the writing? Were they also acting or they left it to the theater actors? Yeah, um, journalists did the research and writing and actors did the acting and dramatists and directors worked as mediators in between. Um, Arthur Arendt, who was a playwright, uh, became particularly important in the living newspaper unit because he had a knack for finding compelling theatrical ways to convey pieces of reporting. For example, in One Third of a Nation, the play about housing that I mentioned earlier, um, Arendt wrote a scene in which uh, housing speculation was uh, presented kind of metaphorically in a movement piece that took place on a piece of green carpeting. And so audiences saw through this really compact metaphor of uh, historical figures fighting to stay on this shrinking green carpet, kind of a story of how housing became more and more scarce over time. Uh, I should say, Arendt wrote the scene 
uh, but it was uh, choreographed by the leftist dancer and choreographer, Helen Tamiris. Um, so there were ways in which theater artists interpreted the research and reporting that journalists were doing in what was more or less something resembling a, a city newsroom with its own morgue that archived um, old newspaper stories for research purposes. Um, and uh, also, you know, um, copy editors and researchers and writers. Uh, the theater folks would take the research done by journalists and then adapt it into the language of the stage. But as you can imagine, even though there was some specialization over time, um, the journalists began to be able to anticipate what might work well on stage, just as the actors and directors began to uh, improvise their own innovations, come up with characters that would then feed back into the script. So there was a little bit of give and take, even though the jobs themselves were relatively discreet. You mentioned one of the shows. Let's talk about some of the other plays and what topics they discussed. And I mean, is this really the early days of cable news or not quite, <laughs> where you have like live news delivery? <laughs> you know, there was a lot of trial and error as this um, group of, uh, of journalists and theater makers worked together to try to figure out what kind of structure and approach would make sense for the stage. So they actually went through a few different iterations uh, before they kind of settled um, on the dramatic structure um, that they would stick with for a little while. Um, the Living Newspaper Unit's very first uh, production, which was about Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, was actually um, canceled because there was an impersonation of Mussolini himself, um, as well as Haile Selassie, and representatives from the State Department actually worried that these impressions of uh, foreign political leaders could get them into hot water. So that was an example where some pushback from above uh, would inform the living newspaper's work. And after the fiasco with Ethiopia, um, Elmer Rice, who was a famous uh, American dr dramatist who was involved in the initial living newspapers quit. He left um, crying cen censorship, um, but those who stayed in the living newspaper decided that they would uh, restrain themselves to domestic issues in order to avoid the problems associated with uh, impersonating foreign uh, dignitator, uh, dignitaries or, or politicians on stage. Um, after Ethiopia, the living newspaper unit would also experiment uh, with a, kind of a more um, vaudevillian variety type structure where they presented a whole bunch of news stories really quickly, almost tabloid style, headline first, one after the other in a really fast moving hour and a half. But the response to that from critics was not particularly positive. Critics kind of felt like the treatment was a little bit too superficial and they weren't really getting anything other than a summary of what had already happened. So after that second somewhat failure, the living newspaper unit decided that they would focus on doing something that the newspaper, their competitors, and the newsreel and the radio could do perhaps not as well as they could, which was to dive into single issues and really explore them theatrically. So rather than rushing to try to break news stories as they came in, which was part of the initial vision, but really challenging to do in the context of theatrical production, the Living Newspaper decided that they would focus on extended single issue treatments um, on housing in the case of one third of a nation, um, on the Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, which uh, had to do with farm subsidies, uh, on government funding for uh, utilities and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, people who know a little bit about 
uh, New Deal history probably recognize that these were all New Deal initiatives, which is no accident given that the living newspapers um, funding came from the Roosevelt government. So ultimately, um, the uh, productions of the living newspaper unit uh, made were by and large focused explorations of um, New Deal uh, issues and the policies that we're seeking to address them. You've talked a little bit already about one third of a nation, which you note was a big hit with hundreds of thousands of people going to see it. Why do you think that show in particular was so popular? It's a really good question. Um, and um, as is the case, whenever we try to figure out why something is popular, there's a little bit of speculation involved. But um, I think that there were a few factors that were particularly important. Um, one, to state the obvious, was just that um, housing was a really pressing issue. The play opens with a, a tenement fire. Um, and um, as the uh, loudspeaker, the kind of narrator loudspeaker, describes what's going on, he also references headlines from across the U.S. that um, that describe similar fires in um, below grade, uh, essentially slum um, slum housing. Um, so. The issue was one that that people in dense urban areas across the U.S. would um, relate to. Um, another factor was um, artistic. As I mentioned, one third of a nation opened with this really spectacular um, housing fire. Earlier living newspapers inspired by the really quick and dirty aesthetic of agitprop street performance had been much more bare bones in terms of their design and costuming. Um, living news, uh, one third of a nation by contrast was pretty cinematic and uh, designers and technicians had actually collected the remnants of actual uh, um, housing units from around New York City and put them together to assemble this huge uh, multi-level um, tenement house on stage. So a lot of audiences were struck by the realism um, and to some extent the kind of grandiosity uh, of the set. One Third of a Nation um, also benefited from a little bit more creative time. Um, there had been fights from early on between journalists and theater makers about how long it should take uh, a production um, to be made. And as you can imagine, journalists really wanted to be able to get things up on the stage as quickly as possible so that they could uh, break news. And theater makers insisted that they needed time to polish and rehearse. Um, one third of a nation benefited from uh, uh, a summer institute that had happened several months before the play debuted in which artists had come together um, essentially to workshop and improvise ideas. One of the outcomes of that workshop, which happened um, at Vassar University, was that scene on a grass mat um, that I described earlier. So I think having some time to kind of um, create away from the pressure of having to immediately put something on stage um, translated in some uh, pretty creative ways to uh, convey the problems of housing um, shortage. Um, One Third of a Nation was also the moment where this innovation of the little man in conversation with this booming loudspeaker that represented mass media um, really kind of came into its own. There had been little bits and pieces of this dynamic in an earlier show uh, called Power, but in One Third of a Nation, um, it was really the backbone of the play and um, reviewers consistently noted that they found this dynamic really engaging. It really gave audiences um, something to hold on to um, as they navigated their own news environment. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I think that those were the main reasons um, that, that one third of a nation became so popular. And, and indeed, after it debuted in New York, um, there were variations of, of that living newspaper that were produced across the U.S. Yeah. So going beyond that one show, like as a whole, what kind of reactions did the public give to this? I mean, were they all very popular or overall, would you think this was a success or not? Uh, it was a mixed bag. It was a decidedly mixed bag. <laughs> um, as you can imagine, because the Federal Theater Project was funded by the Roosevelt government, um, all of its outputs were controversial. The very idea of government funded theater was controversial, but particularly government funded theater that addressed political issues was controversial. So almost from the get go, there were people um, who were very supportive uh, of living newspapers, um, working particularly, you know, critics in, in uh, leftist publications like the Brooklyn Eagle. And then, of course, there were conservative critics that thought this was just a colossal, uh, a colossal waste of money. Um, one thing that um, I've tried to bring out in the book is that uh, because the, the, the political push and pull around living newspapers was so explicit, um, sometimes the editorial messages of the plays themselves have eclipsed in the ways that we tell the story of the living newspaper, have eclipsed the um, experiments in journalism that were happening around this form. Um, in other words, while you certainly can't separate the plays, political messages from the plays themselves, um, historians and critics have tended to focus on the messages at the expense of the journalistic techniques, which were also a really important part of the form. And um, I think you see this when you look at um, newspaper reviews, um, addressing the productions um, throughout the 30s, which consistently remark on what an unusual way of making news living newspapers were. And uh, this is evident in, in all of the distinctive ways that other journalists that critics found to describe the living newspaper. They talk about verbal skeletons rattling across the board, and they talk about flesh and blood newsreels. So you can tell in the ways that they're using language that they're really, uh, they're really searching for ways to describe this distinctive and kind of unusual way of making news. So I think that while, of course, the um, politics of the forum were hotly contested, um, there's also a sub subtler story to be told about how living newspapers were rethinking news. And that's what I try to get at in the book. Yeah, let's return to discussing those critics and the role of Congress in ending these shows. You note that lawmakers accuse the people behind the living newspaper protections of disseminating communist propaganda on stage and behind the scenes. Tell us what happened politically that put an end to these shows. Yeah, so um, the Federal Theater Project started in 1935, and it was dismantled by an act of Congress just four years later in 1939 uh, as the culmination of a series of hearings um, led by a group that would become the, the uh, well, it was at the time the Dyes Committee, um, would become HUAC, the House uh, Committee on Un-American Activities. Um, and uh, the, the committee was essentially charged with uh, determining whether the Federal Theater Project and especially the living newspapers um, were disseminating uh, un-American communist propaganda. Um, Hallie Flanagan, the national director of the Federal Theater Project, um, valiantly uh, argued that the living newspaper was propaganda, but that it was propaganda for democracy. Uh, but the Dyes Committee was not convinced um, and ultimately um, decided that the FTP needed to be uh, dismantled. It's worth noting that um, at the same time, uh, many of the key personnel at the, the Living Newspaper in New York um, had already left. Morris Watson, the managing producer, uh, had actually 
won a, a famous uh, court case um, and actually been offered his job back at the AP. And while he declined to take it, he did uh, ultimately focus more and more of his efforts on the American Newspaper Guild. Arthur Arendt, the, the playwright who had been so central to writing uh, living newspapers, um, accepted a Guggenheim Award um, and began to focus his efforts elsewhere. So um, there was also um, uh, a, a kind of changing over and in personnel that was happening at the same time as this um, very dramatic um, dismantling of the project by Congress. What do you think were the most important contributions of these shows? I think that there are, um, I think that there are, are, are two key, contra- uh, key contributions. Um, one is that living newspapers, uh, did something pretty daring, which was that they tried to rethink the idea of objectivity at a moment when objectivity was really coalescing in professional journalists' understanding of the meaning of their work. Um, Living newspapers, uh, because they were theatrical productions and because they interwove fictional characters with um, with uh, rigorous reporting, couldn't really claim objectivity in the sense of um, uh, of steering clear of emotion or embellishment. They just didn't have access to that defense when it came to claiming legitimacy for their journalistic process, and yet. Um, in their playbills, which were um, actually fashioned to look like newspapers, uh, living um, the living newspaper unit described in some detail a process that was really rigorous and systematic that um, went through uh, multiple um, levels of research, interpretation, collaborative interpretation, um, and therefore achieved a, a, a kind of rigor and systematicity, even if not objectivity in the sense of absence of, um, of politics or absence of emotion or absence uh, of dramatic embellishment. So I think living newspapers really challenge this idea of objectivity um, as, as uh, the decolonial scholars uh, Candace Collison and Marilyn Young uh, call the the view from nowhere. They really ask us to think about, rethink objectivity as a process of collaborative interpretation as opposed to the absence of emotion or or even political commitment. So I think that's a, a really uh, challenging provocation that living newspapers offer. The second contribution that I think is really important is that Um, When news is presented in unconventional ways, it really challenges both journalists and consumers to think critically about the stories that we tell ourselves about the present. Um, They um, kind of denaturalize the the, the ways in which news is presented, which often becomes so familiar, so routine, right? We're, we're used to seeing the same kinds of structures and genres um, in, in the news media that surround us every day that, um, that we might not always take time to question who is being represented and how. And so every time a surprising new form comes up, like the living newspaper, um, it offers an opportunity to rethink the way that um, communities or, or, or political communities together negotiate the way that they uh, tell stories about what's happening in the world and, um, and how we should use our sense of what's happening in the world now to make decisions about the future. I call this idea um, journalistic imagination um, because I think it um, speaks to a capacity to kind of think critically and creatively about how we make news and what ought to be newsworthy. Um, And I I should note that 
as much as living newspapers um, were engaged in journalistic imagination, so too were people um, who used the the newspaper, uh, the living newspaper form to critique it. Um, the um, Black artists Abram Hill and John Silvera. Hill went on, uh, incidentally, to start the um, American Negro Theater, created a living newspaper called Liberty Deferred um, that was about the absolutely kind of glacial um, movement towards um, equality and civil rights that they were observing in the U.S. And um, in the middle of this chronicle, their living newspaper, they... Uh, uh, they set a scene in what they called Lynchotopia, which was presided by a keeper of records who asked um, lynching victims to testify. Um, the play was never produced. Um, I'm sure it was seen as too challenging for the white leadership of the unit, um, but I think it's fascinating how Hill and Silvera um, pressed beyond even the kind of theatrical language of the living newspaper in order to um, convey the brutality of racial violence and and uh, brut and um, lynching on stage. Um, so I think that living newspapers um, cultivate journalistic imagination by providing a flexible form for revisiting what counts as news and how we should consume it. This was just a small note in your book, but I just have to ask about it because it's it's kind of bizarre. Uh, you note that in 1974, some researchers found boxes of archives about this living newspaper project in an airport hangar, which is so strange. Um, so the fact it was pretty much hidden for decades probably probably explains in part why it didn't get much later attention. Still, 1974 was almost 50 years ago by now. So why do you think this has been a forgotten story in journalism history? <laughs> yeah, isn't that story absolutely wild? Um, and it was the theater historian Lorraine Brown um, and John O'Connor and, uh, and actually a national archivist, uh, John Cole, who together um, dug up those manuscripts, which are now thank goodness, safeguarded in the Library of Congress and the National Archives. Um, you know, there was definitely a chill um, at the time of the Cold War around leftist uh, theater that um, I think discouraged many historians from taking up this uh, form, which was quite obviously influenced uh, by uh, the aesthetics of revolutionary Russia, um, by the Weimar Republic. Um, so that explains one gap in, in history. Um, but I think also, you know, it's, it's um, living newspapers um, take some time to reconstruct, you know, the, um, well, this is a challenge um, in theater history writ large, the script only tells a really small part of the story. It really only offers a blueprint for what would have been going on um, on stage. So the work of thinking through what a living newspaper was involves kind of holding together what's going on in the script and um, what might have been happening on stage and um, how actors and directors might have been bringing their sensibilities um, to production. Um, so I think that that uh, that there's lots of work still to be done in, in kind of reconstructing what these pieces might have looked like and sounded like. Um, and I, I guess the, the one other thing that I would say is that um, I, I think it's still a little bit scandalous to think about theater and journalism working together, even though we all know that many of our most popular purveyors of news today are our entertainers, um, like Trevor Noah, right? Like John Stewart. Nonetheless, um, I think um, for good reason, um, we are often reluctant to think about what theater, a tradition that has historically involved the art of lying and deception and illusion might have to offer a tradition of, of truth-telling. Um, 
And uh, I think that as uh, scholars of, of journalism, we need to not throw the baby out with the bad bathwater and that um, thinking about the ways that theater and journalism inform each other need not mean giving up um, on commitments to truth telling, to accuracy, to research or rigorous reporting, because I, I think living news, the creators of living newspapers uh, certainly didn't see themselves as giving up on those things. And then our final question of the show is, why does journalism history matter? Well, I think because the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are uh, and about um, what the present is really matter. And journalism history shows us how these stories and these storytelling techniques have changed over time. Um, and in, in doing that, journalism history gives us both cautionary tales and also um, inspiration and resources for rethinking how we might tell those stories in um, more engaging and more rigorous and uh, more just and equitable ways. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at J History Journal. Until next time, I'm your host, Terry Finneman, signing off with the words of Edward R. Murrow. Good night and good luck. Good luck.